My name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a cardiologist in York. Now, today's video is on the subject of sudden cardiac arrest in healthy people. This is a subject that causes a huge amount of anxiety and fear because it is very difficult to explain. You may recall last year during the European Championships, the Danish football player Christian Eriksen suffered a cardiac arrest whilst actually playing in a match that was being screened live all around the world. And millions were horrified as they watched paramedics desperately trying to resuscitate and revive, revive Christian uh, on the pitch. Thankfully, Christian survived. But the whole episode was hugely traumatic for everyone who saw it unfold. Since then, so many young, healthy people have come to me and said, look, you know, that was really scary. That made me very anxious. Please try and help me get my head around this. Try and help me understand why this has happened. I feel very vulnerable. So I decided to do this video. So let's get started. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen. What is sudden cardiac arrest? Cardiac arrest refers to the cessation of cardiac activity, which leads to hemodynamic collapse. In other words, the heart as a pump, for some reason, fails to generate any kind of meaningful output of blood for a prolonged period of time. And this results in our vital organs, including the heart itself, suffocating and dying. It is also true to say that all death eventually occurs due to cardiac arrest because death is only confirmed when we're able to demonstrate a lack of cardiac activity or as a surrogate for this, a lack of a pulse. So all death eventually is caused by cardiac arrest. It is also true to say that the majority of cardiac arrest is indeed sudden, but it is expected. So as a doctor, when I see patients with severe heart failure or end-stage cancer, I expect death to happen, but it is not possible to predict exactly when it will happen. And therefore the cardiac arrest is sudden, but it is expected. And therefore the patient's death certificate will refer to the cancer as the cause of death or heart failure as the cause of death and not the cardiac arrest, even though the eventual mechanism of death was the cardiac arrest. There is, however, a group of patients who will suffer sudden cardiac arrest as the primary mode of death without an overtly obvious cause. This is the group of patients that we will be talking about, and it is this unexpected sudden cessation of cardiac activity which is by far the most devastating and shocking form of death in all of medicine. It is also a diagnosis that is made in retrospect. There is no way of making the diagnosis beforehand. It is always a retrospective diagnosis and therefore no one is or can make themselves immune from it. And so when we see it happen, it leaves us all feeling exceptionally vulnerable and traumatized. Another reason sudden cardiac arrest is poorly understood is because much of our understanding of the condition comes from studying those patients who are successfully resuscitated from it, i.e. the survivors, and that is a very small proportion. The majority, unfortunately, do not make it. Many patients or many people use the term cardiac arrest and a heart attack interchangeably. They are not the same. A heart attack refers to the heart being damaged by a lack of blood getting to it. The heart can often still continue to function despite the damage, and therefore the blood can still get around the body. In a cardiac arrest, the very definition is that there is no blood going around the body. A severe heart attack can therefore indeed lead to a cardiac arrest, but there are lots of heart attacks that don't. And there are lots of other reasons, cardiac and non-cardiac reasons, by which patients can suffer a cardiac arrest. Now I'm going to show you what a sudden unexpected cardiac arrest looks like. Now this may be really distressing for some and if, if, you, know, if you want to look away, please do. But I do think that if we're going to improve our understanding of it, then we have to confront it. So this is the Denmark-Finland game from last year where Christian Eriksson actually suffered a cardiac arrest. 
the championships. Now you will see that everything is going fine at this point in time. And the game is going fine. And then if you look, you'll see the guy second from the top. This is Christian Eriksson. Just watch him there, watch him there. Unfortunately, this is a blurry video, but look there, there. And he just slumps down, just falls with no control whatsoever. And immediately as he falls, people recognize that there is something really wrong here. And it's hugely distressing. This is the event that happened last year, which shocked so many people. The paramedics run on, and he is completely lifeless there on, on, on the floor. A cardiac arrest will usually present with sudden collapse and usually in a way where the sufferer really has no control at all over it. And therefore it's not uncommon when people have a cardiac arrest and are successfully resuscitated from it, that they're left with damage to their face, broken noses, etc., because of the trauma that happens when they fall because they have no control over it whatsoever. The sh shocking thing about sudden unexpected cardiac arrest is not the actual mechanism, but more so that it affects healthy patients. However, for this, we have to ask ourselves, who is a healthy patient? And really the saying, don't judge a book by its cover is true here because we really make assumptions. We don't know what's going on inside that person's body, but in general, we say, okay, if we see someone who's young, less than 35 years old, we automatically assume that they're healthy. Um, if someone says, look, I don't have any medical illnesses, I don't take any tablets, then we assume that they're healthy. Uh, people who say they lead very good lifestyles, people who are asymptomatic, they have not a care in the world, no symptoms, people who are fit and athletic, like sports stars, footballers, etc., patients who have a good family history, and also patients who've undergone medical screening. So when, when we come across patients like this, we think, oh, these are healthy people. But these are not healthy people. They are seemingly healthy people. We don't know what's going on inside their bodies. We don't even know what their family history is. We don't even know whether they've had any symptoms, etc. And therefore, I think instead of me talking about cardiac arrest in healthy patients, perhaps I should be talking about cardiac arrest in seemingly healthy patients, and that's really important. Now, how common is it? It's very common. Sudden unexpected cardiac arrest is very common. 15 to 20% of all deaths are due to a sudden cardiac arrest. It is largely publicized when someone famous suddenly dies or it happens when it's on TV. However, up to 350,000 people in the USA will suffer from sudden cardiac arrest. Most will go to bed seemingly fine and never wake up the next day. Cardiac arrest is not self-reverting. What that means is that if a patient suffers a cardiac arrest, they will die without some form of resuscitative intervention. And at present, only one in 10 people will survive. As mentioned earlier, cardiac arrest is the terminal endpoint of any progressive medical condition. However, by far and away, the commonest cause and it is an intrinsic problem with the heart where for some reason, the heart is either diseased or becomes diseased and therefore stops functioning. We'll talk about the heart in a bit more detail later. Other causes, so you can have intrinsic heart disease, the heart is diseased, but there are other causes that can cause a cardiac arrest as well. So your heart may be strong, but if there is no blood for it to pump around, then that would lead to a cardiac arrest. So if you are profoundly dehydrated, if you have lost a lot of blood, if you are in shock, uh, those can all lead to cardiac arrest. You may have enough blood, you may have a good strong heart, but if there is no oxygen in your blood, then that could lead to cardiac arrest. If you have a problem with your electrolytes and acid base balance, uh, then that can lead to a cardiac arrest, in particular potassium. If your potassium is too high, your potassium is too low, that can lead to a cardiac arrest. Temperature dysregulation, so hypothermia, hyperthermia. Toxins, and toxins are interesting because, you know, we don't know what, what kind of toxins um, 
uh, people are exposed to. So uh, unfortunately, you, you can't look for every toxin in the world. You can only look for certain toxins. So if um, uh, someone has a cardiac arrest, we don't know whether they may have been exposed to toxins. You can do the basic toxicology screen, uh, but you know, often you can only work out what to look for from by getting a history, either from the patient or the patient's relatives. And if 90% of patients who have a cardiac arrest don't give us a history, then it, uh, again, you don't know whether they could have been exposed to some kind of toxin that could have led to the cardiac arrest. Um, so, and then there is another group where you exclude everything. And as I say, it isn't possible to exclude everything, but you exclude the common things, common toxins, electrolyte imbalance, etc. And despite all those things, they've still had a cardiac arrest. And that falls under the label of being unexplained. And unexplained cardiac arrest makes us all feel very uncomfortable. We all feel better knowing. We all feel better if there is an explanation because then that makes us think, okay, well, we can take measures to safeguard against it. If it is unexplained, then we feel very vulnerable. Um, however, unfortunately, if you do a search in Christian Eriksen, it still appears that his cardiac arrest remains unexplained. There was another footballer who again had a cardiac arrest on the pitch. His name was Fabrice Mwamba. Thankfully, he survived his cardiac arrest remains unexplained. So often, you know, uh, cardiac arrests are unexplained. They happen, we don't know why they happen, but it's also important to know that, that we are limited in what, what we know. Uh, we cannot look for everything. Our technology is just not good enough to look for everything. So we look for the common things. If we don't find the common abnormalities, then we call it unexplained cardiac arrest. Now, this is an interesting schematic which talks about what the causes of sudden cardiac death are. And as mentioned earlier, the majority of cardiac arrests occur because of intrinsic asymptomatic cardiac disease, meaning that the patient has disease in their heart, but they don't know anything about it. So they look healthy, uh, they say they're healthy, but there's something going on in the heart. And broadly speaking, there are three major things that can go wrong with the heart. Um, the heart is a pump and that pump may be diseased either from birth or over a period of time. We know that there are lots of people with severe weakening of their heart muscle who go about their daily lives with few or no symptoms. When the heart as a pump is diseased, we refer to it as a cardiomyopathy. There are various forms of cardiomyopathy, so some people inherit a cardiomyopathy. A famous example was of Miles Frost. Now, Miles Frost was the son of David Frost. David Frost was a very famous presenter. And David Frost was on a cruise ship when he suffered a fatal heart attack at the age of 74. He had a post-mortem which showed that his heart was abnormally thickened and that he had a condition called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is a inherited condition where you just inherit abnormal heart muscle. Now, David Frost didn't die of the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, he died of a heart attack. But as it is a condition that can be passed on to children, Unfortunately, no one really screened his children. And his, he had a son called Miles. And Miles was never told that he could have inherited this from his father. And one morning, Miles went out running at the age of only 31 and suffered a fatal cardiac arrest. So you can have inherited cardiomyopathies. So, you know, the heart muscle, for some reason, as abnormal. The pump may be diseased as a result of infections such as myocarditis or valvular abnormalities such as a leaky or tight valve. Uh, and often these do manifest with symptoms, but sometimes they may not. Uh, sometimes those symptoms may be so mild that the patient ignores them. And then sometimes the cardiac arrest can be the first symptom of the diseased pump. I think when many people were found dead in their beds after COVID during the first wave of COVID-19, this could have been due to infection affecting their heart, causing a myocarditis, which then resulted in their heart malfunctioning. In cardiology, how do you look for a defective heart pump? You know, And we use ultrasound or echocardiography to tell us about the health of the heart as a pump. Uh, and in more complex cases, we can use an MRI scan. Now, the second thing that can go wrong with the heart is the heart as a pump may be strong, but the blood supply to the heart may be compromised. This is termed coronary artery disease. It is um, uh, by far 
the single most dangerous health condition in the Western world. The coronary arteries develop progressive buildup of plaque and often that happens silently. The patient doesn't know anything about it. And over time, there is this restriction of blood flow to the heart muscle. This then man will manifest with symptoms of chest discomfort, which is termed angina. These are the people who then go to their doctors and told, oh, you've got a 90% blockage in your heart artery. You need a stent or a bypass. But actually 50% of these patients who are developing progressive uh, plaque in their heart arteries have no warning. And in those cases, the problem is that the plaque is not actually restricting blood flow and therefore the patient has no symptoms, but for some reason, a bit chooses to break off one day. And there lies the problem that a bit breaks off, the body thinks you've sustained a wound where it's broken off and forms a blood clot. And that blood clot inadvertently blocks off the rest of the blood vessel. Suddenly the heart suffocates, this leads to the heart uh, not being able to pump blood out, and this then leads to sudden cardiac arrest or a heart attack. How do you look for this? How do you look for uh, disease in the arteries? Well, you can do some kind of exercise testing, stress testing, or even better, actually directly look into the vessels by means of something called a cardiac CT scan or even an invasive angiogram. So you can look into the heart arteries non-invasively or also invasively. And then finally, the third thing that can go wrong with the heart is that the heart is an electrical organ and therefore the heart may choose to go into a heart rhythm disturbance and all heart rhythm disturbances cause the heart to become less efficient when pumping blood out. And therefore, if the heart rhythm disturbance is fast or chaotic, then this would make the heart very inefficient as a pump. And this would then lead to circulatory collapse, sudden cardiac arrest. It is increasingly understood that some people can inherit a tendency to develop dangerous heart rhythm disturbances. However, you can only look for these through careful family screening. And if someone has a family member who has had a unexplained dangerous heart rhythm disturbance, then you suspect it. Again, it is not possible to diagnose a heart rhythm disturbance prospectively. We can only diagnose it retrospectively. And so it has to happen after which one can say, okay, you have this heart rhythm disturbance. And sometimes that heart rhythm disturbance may manifest with a sudden cardiac arrest. We use ECGs and prolonged heart rhythm monitoring to look for heart rhythm disturbances. The important thing to say, however, is that whilst it's scary that anyone anywhere could have a heart rhythm disturbance, if you have a strong pump and that pump is getting all the blood it needs, then it is unlikely that that heart rhythm uh, disturbance is going to be dangerous. Unlikely, not impossible. Now this schematic here basically shows that in general, patients who suffer a sudden cardiac arrest at less than 35 years of age are more likely to have an inherited problem, an inherited cardiomyopathy like Miles Frost did, or possibly an inherited electrical disturbance of the heart, something called a channelopathy. And those above the age of 35 are by far more likely to have coronary artery disease. So in general, congenital pump problems, congenital electrical problems are the things that tend to cause sudden cardiac arrests in young people under the age of 35. And it is traditional heart attacks because of plaque building up, plaque breaking off, that is more likely to cause uh, cardiac arrests in people above the age of 35 by far. It is, also to, it is also important to appreciate that in addition to the substrate, you need some triggers to present in a specific way to lead to that cardiac arrest. As you will see that some people have inherited this, they're getting along with their lives. Why do they choose to have that cardiac arrest on that particular day at that particular time? And I think it's, this is the million dollar question. But what we do know is that certain triggers can all sort of uh, manifest together and it can be a bit of a perfect storm. So things like environmental stress, psychological stress, dehydration, fever, electrolyte imbalance, toxins, lack of sleep, exercise, these can all be triggers that cause the already, already loaded gun to eventually fire. Now, 
over half of patients, half of the patients who have a sudden cardiac arrest, sudden cardiac death, have pre-existing asymptomatic cardiovascular disease, and interestingly, more women than men. Sudden cardiac arrest or sudden cardiac death is therefore the first symptom in these patients. If this is the case, if you don't have any symptoms, then how do you look for it uh, before it happens, you know? Uh, it would be too cost inefficient to put everyone through rigorous cardiac examination. And because some things can develop with time, how often would you look for it? And therefore, it can be useful to try and identify a higher risk um, subset of patients. Uh, you know, if you can identify who is more likely to have uh, sudden cardiac arrest, then you can look at those patients more aggressively and investigate them more aggressively for asymptomatic cardiac disease. So who are these people who are more likely to have asymptomatic cardiac disease, which may manifest with cardiac arrest? And these, those are patients who have comorbidities such as diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, obesity, smokers. These are all people who are at a higher risk of coronary artery disease, plaque building up in their heart arteries and as a consequence, at a higher risk of sudden cardiac arrest. And so whenever people carry these comorbidities, it's important that we look, investigate them aggressively and manage them aggressively, because these are risk factors, not only for coronary disease, but also for cardiac arrest. But there are other things that can also increase the risk of cardiovascular disease, which are not as uh, commonly publicized. And actually those things can also increase your risk of cardiac death, sudden cardiac arrest, so family history. And it's really, really important that people are aware of what their family history is. You know, a lot of people don't know what other members of their family died of. In fact, I was unfortunate enough that my own brother-in-law, um, uh, one day, you know, he was only sort of late forties and he suddenly dropped down dead. Uh, and because of cultural norms, no post-mortem was done. The body was cremated very quickly. And so we were left completely uh, in the dark as to what could have been the mechanism of the cardiac arrest. It is important that patients who have a sudden cardiac death have a post-mortem so that things can be studied because you know some of these things can be passed down in families and it does have a bearing on other members of the family. Again, diet is really, really important because a lot of emphasis is put on blaming the patient for their dietary choices. But whilst this may be true to a certain extent, the reality is that the majority of what we are sold under the pretext of healthy is also very unhealthy. There is so much adulteration that goes on in the food even before it ends up on our tables that we're probably all being exposed to a number of toxins which were deemed safe by the FDA but probably are not. And I would urge you to read the story about how aspartum got um, approval by the FDA because that just tells you how much um, adulteration there is in uh, all this. Uh, also refined vegetable oils, high fructose corn syrup. Again, stress is hugely important and we definitely know that stress is associated with a higher risk of sudden cardiac arrest, alcohol, kidney dysfunction, atrial fibrillation, sleep apnea, all really, really important. So those people who have these things really should, I would urge them to get investigated uh, to make sure that they're not developing asymptomatic cardiac disease. And if they are, then one should do things to try and modify these risk factors. Um, it's interesting also that there are certain triggers for cardiac um, uh, arrest, sudden cardiac arrest or sudden cardiac death. There appears to be a diurnal and seasonal variation. And more cardiac arrests tend to happen between 6 a.m. and noon. They tend to be more frequent on a Monday and less frequent at weekends, probably because of the stress that is involved. They tend to be more common during winter months and less common during summer. They tend to be more common during and actually after exercise. And also psychosocial uh, factors can play a big role. Air pollution can also play a big role. But 
the question then is, okay, so someone has a sudden cardiac arrest, sudden cardiac death, you do a post-mortem and um, you find no significant problem with the structure of the heart. Um, and when we look about 27 to 43% of patients under the age of 35, um, had no evidence of structural heart disease on autopsy. But it is important to understand that most of the study of the dead is done really, really badly. A lot of time when post-mortems are done, the only purpose is just to exclude the possibility of foul play. And often pathologists do not devote the kind of time uh, to try and work out exactly what the mechanism of death was, what they want to know is that it wasn't due to foul play. And if you carry out detailed histology, it is possible to find contributing abnormalities in almost 80%. So almost 80% of these people who have this unexplained cardiac arrest, if you do proper histology with an experienced pathologist, then it is possible to find contributing abnormalities on almost 80%. And if you do histology, take tissue from the heart, study it under microscope, and that's also normal, then we think that up to 50% of those people probably died because they inherited some kind of abnormal, some kind of electrical vulnerability of the heart. This is known as inherited arrhythmic syndrome. And genetic testing has revealed uh, that a disease causing mutation is present in 31% of families. Uh, and 30% of these tend to be inherited arrhythmic syndrome causing mutations. So again, I think if we are going to learn more about cardiac arrest, sudden cardiac death, then we have to uh, start uh, studying the dead, you know, doing most more postmortems, training pathologists, giving pathologists more funding and time so that they can carry out a more detailed assessment of the heart, because that will undoubtedly contribute to our knowledge and eventually allow us to safeguard against this eventuality in certain vulnerable patients. So the next question is that if sudden cardiac arrest is something we can't predict or prevent, then what can we do? And the answer is that we can prepare. It is important to be prepared. The one thing that we know that we can do, which could make a huge impact is to learn to deliver effective resuscitation. Unfortunately, resuscitation training has become a bit of an industry and learning resuscitation has become an expensive and excessively confusing chore, when actually it should be a life skill that should be taught to everyone free of charge, because it is the one skill that can really make a difference. Now, when patients suffer a cardiac arrest, we see three types of heart rhythm abnormalities and being able to recognize these heart rhythm abnormalities can be exceptionally helpful. Now, most patients <coughs> with a underlying cardiac problem with intrinsic heart disease will go into a rhythm called ventricular fibrillation. And in this rhythm, the heart is completely uh, <clears throat> chaotic. It's exceptionally fast. It's got the squiggly line, as you can see on the screen. And this is ventricular fibrillation. So the heart is trying to contract, but it's not really making any meaningful contraction and uh, therefore no blood is being ejected from it. If we see ventricular fibrillation, it tells us that the underlying cause is likely to be cardiac, but more importantly, this is the rhythm that responds to electrical shock treatment. One in three people with ventricular fibrillation, so if someone has a cardiac arrest and you see ventricular fibrillation, one in three people will survive if a shock is given to the patient, uh, cardiac shock is given to the patient as quickly as possible, and then the underlying cause is addressed. This is a second uh, rhythm that you could see. So this is called asystole. This is a flat line. Uh, this is the worst prognosis of all. This is a rhythm that does not respond to shock. Often patients go into ventricular fibrillation, and if the ventricular fibrillation is not tackled by shock, then the rhythm will degrade into asystole. And this really means that the chances of the patient surviving are much, much poorer. This rhythm is addressed by giving the patient CPR using adrenaline, but the success rates are low. So only 10.6% success rates. 
There's one other rhythm disturbance that we should know about, and this is called PEA, pulseless electrical activity. The point with this rhythm is it looks like a normal person's rhythm. When you look at this, this just looks normal, but the patient does not have a pulse. So the rhythm looks organized, but there is no meaningful contraction and hence no pulse. And when we see PEA, pulseless electrical activity, the consequence is often a non-cardiac cause, although sometimes a cardiac cause can also do it, but generally you're looking at things like a lack of oxygen, a lack of volume, temperature imbalance, toxins, electrolyte problems, uh, thrombosis, uh, pulmonary embolism, etc. This is again a non-shockable rhythm. And really what you have to do here is try and tackle the underlying cause. And if you can do that, then that is the patient's best chance of surviving. So the next thing to say is that it's important to try and work out, you know, what are the survival rates of a, of a cardiac arrest that occurs outside the hospital? Because 80% of cardiac arrests occur in the patient's home. And only 20% of these people are shockable by the time the paramedics reach. So they may have been shockable. They may have been in ventricular fibrillation. They may have been successfully shocked. Their lives could have been saved. But by the time the paramedics get there, they've missed the boat. And only 20% are now shockable. And therefore, if early resuscitation could be given to the patient, then one could significantly improve the survival rates. Because the problem is, if no resuscitation is given, then that ventricular fibrillation degrades into rhythms like asystole, which do not respond to shock. And it's interesting that where early CPR has been given, success rates are much better. So if you look at different countries, in the UK, the survival rates from out-of-hospital sudden cardiac arrest are only 8.4%. But in places like Holland, they're 21%, and in Norway, they're 24%. And this is because these patients get given resuscitation even before the paramedics get there by bystanders. And for, so if we look at the rates of bystander CPR in the UK, 43% of cardiac arrests have CPR given to them by a bystander who's observed them collapse, whereas in Norway, it's 73%. Unfortunately, bystanders are still just uh, doing cardiac massage and resuscitation. They're not, not many are doing defibrillation, which is the most effective therapy. But even delivering some kind of resuscitation can make a substantial difference to the patient's outcome. I think it's really important, therefore, for us to understand that giving resuscitation as early as possible is hugely important because it keeps the patient in a shockable rhythm for longer. With every minute defibrillation or a shock treatment is delayed, survival chances fall by seven to 10%. So if the patient goes into cardiac arrest and they're defibrillated within a minute, the chances of surviving are 90%. If the patient has not been defibrillated within 10 minutes, the survival chances are 5%. And that's why I think everyone has to be aware and they have to be able to recognize when a cardiac arrest is happening and immediately call for help. And then what they want to do is deliver early resuscitation, cardiac massage to try and buy time. And as soon as a defibrillator is available, you try and shock the patient if the patient is in ventricular fibrillation and then deliver post-resuscitation care, which is to try and reverse the underlying problem to maintain the patient's quality of life. So how do you recognize cardiac arrest? Uh, it's important to start CPR in any unresponsive person with absent or abnormal breathing. So if you see someone collapse, they're not breathing, get, go ahead and start resuscitation. Even slow labored breathing uh, could be considered, be, could be a sign of cardiac arrest and you wouldn't do that patient a huge amount of harm by resuscitating or commencing resuscitation. Sometimes a short period of seizure-like movements can occur at the start of the cardiac arrest. Um, and it's important to assess the person after the seizure is stopped. And if the patient is unresponsive, it's important to start resuscitation. Uh, and the most important thing here is 
obviously, you know, to call for help because the thing that is going to save that person's life is a defibrillator and delivering a shock treatment to the heart. So it's important to alert emergency medical services immediately by dialing 999 on the phone uh, if the patient is unconscious. And if you have a mobile phone, then dial it, put it on speaker and continue with the resuscitation. If you're a lone rescuer and you have to leave the victim, then uh, go get help as quickly as possible, come back and start resuscitation. And in terms of resuscitation, you know, resuscitation is generally very simple. Unfortunately, it's been made more complex and confusing, but basically what you want to do is you want to get oxygen into the body and you want to get that oxygen around mechanically because the heart is not doing that. And if you can do that effectively, then you give the patient the best chance of surviving. And so the most important thing is to start compressing on the chest, on the lower half of the sternum, just here, and pressing in and pressing quite deep, up to five centimeters, and compressing quite quickly at a rate of 100 to 120 times a minute with as few interruptions as possible. Chest compression, if delivered effectively, is very, very tiring. And that is why it is so important for people to call help because it is just physically not possible for people to do it for several minutes without taking a rest. And the important thing is to allow the chest to recoil and then press and recoil and then press. And it, wherever possible, it's good to do this on a firm surface so your compression is more effective. I think it's also important to get oxygen, oxygen into the body and uh, the easy way is to blow into the patient's mouth. Some people feel uncomfortable about that. I remember when I was a young junior doctor, I had someone that I had to do this and they'd vomited and I was very, and they had a lot of blood around their face. So I was a little bit apprehensive, but if you can, then it's important to do that. If you're unable to do it or unwilling to provide the ventilation, then still just resuscitating the chest, just compressing on the chest, doing cardiac massage can be very helpful. If you are able to get oxygen into the body, then it's a good idea to breathe twice and then get on and massage the chest for 30 compressions and then two breaths, etc., until you get help. And as soon as the defibrillator arrives, the important thing is just see what the rhythm is. And if the rhythm shows that there is ventricular fibrillation, deliver a shock. You have to be very careful when you deliver the shock that no one else is touching the body or anything like that, because then you inadvertently shock someone else. But otherwise, deliver the shock. The shock is the thing that is going to save the person's life. So these are these kind of basic life support settings where, you know, you uh, compress the chest, breathe in, compress the chest, breathe in, and shock. Now, one of the interesting things to my mind is, well, you know, this is something that is so important in this setting, you know, where, where the only thing you can't, you can't predict it, it can happen to anyone, it can happen anywhere. And the most important thing is therefore that people, everyone should know how to resuscitate the patient. Unfortunately, this, which should be a life skill is not taught um, as a life skill. Uh, this was an interesting survey where they looked at basic life support education in secondary schools and they found they surveyed 20, 65 schools and they found that there were only five schools that provided universal training programs for students and an additional 31 that offered training as part of an extracurricular program or chosen module, which is such a shame because if we are going to improve outcomes from this devastating condition, then every child should learn how to do this. And it is not a case of being taught this for one afternoon in a year, but they should be taught this regularly so that they are best equipped because that one skill could save someone's life and could allow us to achieve something in our lives which is greater than anything else, which is to save someone's life. So it is an absolute shame that schools are not offering this vital life skill just as routine and to everyone. So this really brings me to the end of my uh, presentation. Uh, this is dedicated to the memory of Ugo Ehiog, who was a very famous footballer, he used to play for Aston Villa, who suddenly dropped down dead after training. He was only 40. Uh, another um, another footballer, Mark Vivian Fowey, he unfortunately also died 
um, and so many more, but it is also dedicated to the bravery of those who survived. So this is Fabrice Mwamba and Christian Eriksen, and Christian Eriksen has actually started playing football again, so this is remarkable. I think I'd like to finish off with three points. You know, the more I mature, the more I realize how little we know. After Christian Eriksen's cardiac arrest, many patients came to see me and they said, you know, help us, help us. How do I prevent this from happening? And the answer is you can't. Um, you know, our length of life is governed by our age, our genetics, our bad luck and our lifestyles. And we only really can manage our lifestyles. But other than that, genetics, age, just pure bad luck can still lead us to have bad things happen to us. So rather than worry about that which we have no control over, what we should do is try and take control of our quality of life. Because actually, if you think about it, quality of life is more important than length of life. And the more I think about it, uh, our quality of lives can be improved by caring, sharing, and being grateful. And when we care and we share and we're grateful, it brings joy into our lives. And that is so, so important. What's gonna happen is gonna happen, but to try and maximize our lives, to try and maximize uh, our quality of lives is something we should all be aspiring to. Now, Shane Warne, as you know, unfortunately also died suddenly and uh, a lot of people came to me and they were very hurt by what happened to him and I consoled them uh, by saying to them that look you know actually if you think about it whilst this is such a devastating thing for those that are left behind if you think about it how would one want to die would we just want to die where we suddenly just we don't know anything about it one minute and it's all over or would we rather get old, lose our faculties, feel like we're a burden to others. So those people who unfortunately have died, it's devastating, but we can console ourselves by this, by thinking that, you know, if they live their life to the full, then that's not a bad way to go. Um, it's not a bad way to go when your quality of life is still intact. And finally, what I would say is, you know, this teaches me the one thing that uh, reinforces the one thing that I tell all my patients, which is that it's important that we live every moment as if it were our last. And if we do so for long enough, then one day we will be proven right. Thank you so much. I am so grateful to you watching. And once again, I apologize for not having put any videos out, but it's been hideously busy. So I'm going to get started again. All the best. Take care.